when I'm interpreting the imaging of the temporal bone, the phrase, the tegmen, comes out of my mouth all the time. And so I thought this topic was worthy of its own lecture. The tegmen comes in two parts. There's the tegmen tympani, which is over the tympanic cavity, and the tegmen mastoideum, which is over the mastoid air cells. If you want to get technical, there's also a tegmen antry, which lies over the mastoid antrum, but I almost never use that term. I just lump it in with the tegmen mastoideum. The tegmen forms the floor of the middle cranial fossa, well, part of the floor, the posterior floor of the middle cranial fossa, and the lateral petrous apex is the tegmen. It's best evaluated in the coronal plane, both on CT and MRI, and it's best evaluated with CT, although we'll also be talking about its manifestations on MRI. Here's what the tegmen is supposed to look like, a normal tegmen. Since this is the middle ear cavity, this is the tegmen tympani over the tympanic cavity. And here's a segment of tegmen mastoidium. And, but here's really where the tegmen mastoidium is seen in its full glory all over the mastoid air cells. And I, I would consider this part of the tegmen mastoidium as well, although I think some people would reserve it only for the lateral portion of the tegmen. Notice how flat overall the tegmen is. It doesn't dive down deep out laterally, right? It's more or less flat across its entire surface. Ick. Should the tegmen be? It turns out there's wide biologic variation from person to person and even side to side on an individual. Sometimes the tegmen gets so thin that you can't even see it on CT, but it still presents an intact barrier between the dura and the air of the temporal bone. Sometimes you'll have mastoid air cells interposed between the tympanic cavity and the tegmen itself that provide an additional barrier. Be careful when you're evaluating the tegmen in infants because it may be incompletely ossified in the first year of life and it may look like your patient has superior semicircular canal dehiscence, but that's just normal progression of ossification. So this is what I would consider the normal thickness of the tegmen. It has maybe one to two millimeters thickness and is fairly uniform across its path. This is some thinning right here. You can barely even see on CT, some might argue. You can't see it on CT, but this is still acceptable. There's no fluid leak through here. There's no depression of the dura. We have to accept that sometimes the tegmen gets a little bit thin. Here's a situation where there are air cells interposed between the tympanic cavity and the tegmen. And this just adds added protection. This patient is less likely to run into trouble with their tegmen. Here's what I was talking about in infants less than one year old. There are apparent gaps here in the tegmen mastoidium. And look at the superior semicircular canals. You would call that superior semicircular canal dehiscence in an adult, but this is a child less than one year old, and we know that it takes about a year for the temporal bone to fully ossify. These are all perfectly normal. So what causes gaps in the tegmen? Well, you can erode your tegmen classically from cholesteatoma, sometimes from tumor. You can have increased intracranial pressure, uh, whether it's from venous outflow insufficiency or from obesity. There is sometimes congenital thinning of the tegmen, like in that uh, case of normal thinning that I showed you before. Fractures, whether they are oblique fractures or longitudinal fractures, whether they're otic capsule sparing or not, fractures of the temporal bone almost always involve the tegmen. Sometimes you can get a purely horizontal, horizontal fracture, but almost all of these fractures will involve the tegmen. I don't know whether you'd call that a dehiscence, but it's a gap in the tegmen. Here's an example of cholesteatoma. There's cholesteatoma filling the epitympanum and eroid, eroding the ossicles, and you can see that the tegmen has thinned to the point of non-existence. Now, does this look any different from that normal thinning case? Not really, but the presence of the cholesteatoma underneath clues you in that that's a problem.
remember that one of the reasons it's important to treat cholesteatoma is that if it does extend through the tegmen, you can result in brain abscess. This is a cholesteatoma that eroded through the tegmen, allowed infection to come from the mastoid air cells and extend up into the brain. And this brain abscess right above the petrous apex is a classic long-term sequela of cholesteatoma. This is an example of tumor causing tegmen dehiscence. Uh, this happens to be metastatic disease from lung cancer, but any tumor arising in this location, of course, could erode through the tegmen. You can get dehiscence of the tegmen is with chronically increased intracranial pressure. The key finding on this CT is that the dura has been depressed. There is no longer air between the head of the malleus and the dura. Right? The dura has fallen down and now contacts the ossicles. That's not normal. If you don't see an air gap between the ossicles and the dura, that's a good sign that your tegmen is no longer intact. Remember to look for secondary findings of increased intracranial pressure, intracranial hypertension, such as enlargement of the cella turcica, such as scalloping of the inner table of the calvarium, the middle cranial fossa, a classic location for that. There are other signs that I'm not showing you here, like increased CSF space around the second cranial nerves in the orbit, papilledema, tonsillar settling, enlarged arachnoid granulations, all the findings that we associate with intracranial hypertension. And don't forget one of the most important causes of intracranial hypertension is venous outflow insufficiency, where there is narrowing of both. It has to be both. Transverse sinuses usually right about where the vein of Lebay is coming in, and these focal narrowing will cause increased pressure in the venous system and secondarily increased pressure throughout the intracranial vault. Here's an example of a temporal bone fracture showing that it's running up through the tegmen. Sometimes it's easiest to appreciate this on coronal and I find sagittal imaging to appreciate that superior extent of the fracture. This is important to evaluate because remember, these are not fracture lines, these are fracture planes. And once, you, once it comes up through the tegmen, it's usually got to continue out through the skull somewhere. So it's important to find the eventual extent of those fractures after they come up through the tegment. What are the key imaging features that we're looking for when we're evaluating the tegment? We want to see whether there is an encephalocele or meningocele, whether the tegment has failed and allowed intracranial content down into the ear. We want to know whether there is leak of CSF, if there's a dural failure and then the CSF is leaking into the ear. I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about how flare is critical to distinguishing CSF leak from just inflammatory debris in the ear. We want to look for concomitant superior semicircular canal dehiscence. If you're thinning your tegmen, you're probably also thinning the superior covering of your superior semicircular canal. And we want to look for depression of the tegmen, particularly laterally. Uh, if the tegmen is de depressed, then it can get in the way operatively. And we talk about this when we're doing preoperative planning for cochlear implantation, for example. Looking for an encephalocele through a tegmen dehiscence, the key sequence is direct coronal T2s, not, fiesta, not the steady state free procession, fiesta kiss, direct coronal T2s. We don't routinely perform this sequence, but when we suspect encephalocele, it gets added to our protocol. Here's an encephalocele, there's an encephalocele coming down through defects. You can appreciate the defect in the tegmen even on the MRI as this dark cortex is interrupted right there and then continues on right there. Note the distortion of the sulci that occurs in the overlying brain. This is a super important clue that the brain is herniated down through the defect. This is not just a meningocele. You can actually see brain through the defect on both sides and distortion of the overlying sulci, whether they're twisted, whether they're enlarged, a very important clue. Evaluating dehiscent tegmen. One of the most important things to evaluate is whether there is a CSF leak. So you're going to look for bright T2 signal inside the tympanic cavity, right? 
But how do you know that this is CSF and not just inflammatory fluid, inflammatory debris filling the middle ear cavity? Because it can look exactly the same on T2. Flare is your friend. If this T2 bright material suppresses out on a flare sequence, it's made of CSF. Inflammatory debris, even the tiniest bit of protein, will prevent this flare suppression. So inflammatory debris continues its T2 bright when you uh, try to flare suppress, but CSF disappears. Here's the counterexample, a patient with inflammatory debris in the mastoid ear cells bilaterally. And you can see that when we apply flare, it stays bright because it's not made of CSF. It, it's got proteinaceous debris and it. it's inflammatory. Remember to look for concomitant superior semicircular canal dehiscence. There is thinning of this entire tegment and you can see a big encephalocele has come down uh, through the tegment mastoidium into the mastoid air cells, but also the superior semicircular canal is dehisced. This, this portion of the tegment is thinned just like this portion of the tegment is thinned. In this lecture, I talked about the horizontal configuration of the tegment and how it's a straight line. Here's why this is important. In patients who have chronically increased intracranial pressure, they get depression of the lateral tegment, and the entire tegment is drawn down inferiorly. Intracranial contents take its place. This can also happen in chronic inflammatory disease with atelectasis of the air cells drawing the tegment down. Uh, when you see this, it's important to talk about it because this is the expected course in a mastoidectomy as for cochlear implantation. And we don't want the surgeon to accidentally run into brain when trying to do a mastoidectomy. How do we treat tegmin dehiscence? The goal of surgery is to close the defect and put the brain back where it belongs. We use a middle cranial fossa approach. We reduce or remove the herniated brain. And then we place an autologous graft, an onlay bone graft over the defect along the petrous apex. So here's a patient, you can see the large defect in the tegmin mastoidium. Post-op imaging, you can see the cranioplasty from the middle cranial fossa approach, and you can even see a piece of autologous bone graft right there. This is just a piece of the bone that was taken on the way into the skull. Here's a sagittal image, again showing that bone graft fragment overlying the tegmen. And on the coronal, comparing before and after, uh, here's the, the defect I had already shown you before, and here it is after with pieces of onlay bone graft within the defect and all of the fluid that had been leaking out into the mastoid air cells and middle ear cavity is now replaced by air, much better. Remember, when you're evaluating CT and MRI of the temporal bones to always review the tegment. 